Thanks a lot. It's, uh, it's great to be back in Canada. I'm originally from Ontario. I have a brother that lives here in Vancouver, uh, but I'm in California. So that's the view from our office in San Francisco. Um, really awesome to be here and to be speaking about growth. We talked a lot about you know, traction and thinking about building a company. Elliot came on board and talked about founding his company and thinking about a 10-year plan. And that's exactly what I have the theme of today. It's about planning for the long term and thinking about the journey from day one. So whether you're coming up with an idea, whether you have your Series A, or whether you're in growth mode, what the theme of this presentation is about is how you can think about ways to accelerate innovation. Whether that's developing new ideas in-house, whether that's with partnering with others, or whether that's thinking about uh, mergers and acquisitions to try to accelerate that growth. So our journey started back in the summer of 2009. The world was fundamentally a different place. It was the middle of the Great Recession and businesses around the world were struggling. And we had a vision to make it incredibly easy for businesses to find, buy, and use the cloud services they need. So inherently in our business, we wanted to partner with a ton of great cloud companies, whether that be Box, Microsoft, DocuSign, uh, SendGrid, et cetera. And at the same time, we wanted to distribute through um, trusted brands globally. But with two people in an apartment at the time, uh, two Canadians in San Francisco, um, we really didn't have a lot of resources to be able to achieve our vision. So what we did is we tried to identify frameworks and companies that had network effects to see how we could speed our growth from being uh, two people in a small apartment only uh, five years ago to now over 350 around the world um, and continuing that growth. The other thing that was inherent as part of our strategy was to keep somewhat of an under the radar profile um, so we've been pretty quiet to market. Many of you may have never heard of AppDirect. We're kind of a behind the scenes, white labeled platform and network. Um, and that's part of this journey. So what I'm hoping that everyone will take away from this is thinking about themes that you can use to accelerate your traction and accelerate your growth based on our experience. So um, the focus in a lot of the conversations today has been how do you create that spark? How do you think about that initial traction? What I want to talk about today is really thinking about how do you sustain growth beyond the initial traction. So what, I, what uh, really is the key here is thinking about a plan. So a lot of times when you hear about companies, they say, I had that aha moment, and then I started it. I didn't think it was going to be a big business. And then we iterated, and now we're a big business. Um, but what I challenge everyone to do is have a long-term vision and have a plan. So I'm going to go through three different kind of phases to that plan. One is your growth strategy. Two is how you can establish network effects. And three is how you can think about a consistent framework to innovate. So our growth strategy, we called contained growth strategy. And we established that uh, through one of our investors, uh, Peter Thiel. Um, and, and he talked a lot about the analogy of Facebook, where it started at Harvard, um, whether that's uh, one company that he founded, also with Palantir, uh, the security startup. They started with the CIA. And there's a lot of benefits to thinking about how you can contain your growth so things don't go out of control. So if you look at Facebook, they said, OK, we're going to start with Harvard. Um, then we're going to grow to Ivy League schools. We're going to go to colleges, high schools, and then everywhere. This is a story that's very familiar with everyone. Then they said, OK, we can also grow based on geography, based on tech capability. So thinking about profiles, photos, videos, marketplace, et cetera. And there are many other accesses. So it could be demographic, language, device. Now, if Mark Zuckerberg would have started by trying to think about all these things at once, chances are it wouldn't have worked. Um, you know, a couple people in a room cannot do all these things at once. Um, and Elliot articulated this as well. If he tried to do his 10-year vision in one day, probably wouldn't have worked. So how do you think about a way to methodically grow and maintain that growth? So what we said, you know, again, being two people in an apartment, we said, OK, there's different segments that we can distribute our product through. We can work with telecoms, with retailers, with other SaaS companies. We can grow by starting in a certain geography, which we actually started in Canada, even though we were based in California. Um, and then thinking about you know, how we grow to Europe, international, um, as well tech capability. So with a couple engineers in a room, you can build some cool stuff, but you can't build everything. So how do we think about a process for con consistently innovating and driving new things? And then, again, thinking about how do we grow the end user demographic? How do we expand languages? How do we think about growing across devices? So 
What we articulated in actually our first slide presentation, um, which uh, one of our early investors was Inovia Capital, some of them are in this room, we showed this slide, which we called the spider graph. And we defined our core, and we said this is our objective for the first two years. And these are the different axes that we can grow. Um, and what we're going to plan is that in each phase of growth, that could correlate to funding rounds, that could create, correlate to milestones, we're going to think about how we can achieve success. And that was really key to enabling us to think about our short-term objectives and then also balancing the long-term growth. So at that stage, that's how we created that initial spark. And what we needed to do is say, OK, in this like, first phase, in this, in this core phase when we're starting and trying to get traction, um, what can we do to make our, jo our jobs easier in the future by creating that, that spark and momentum? So this is the second framework that, that I'm going to use, which we define as magnetic momentum. So what we said is, how do we work with one brand? So again, thinking about that initial core, we said we want to work with telecom in a given country with a given ecosystem. So we signed up Bell. It was a 12-month sales cycle, you know, really long, painful negotiation, but you know, big brand and great way to start. And then through Bell, we got a few applications that were a part of their network and ecosystem. And then through Bell, Deutsche Telekom caught onto it. And then um, we got another subset of apps, so some bigger brands that might be more familiar. And then AT&T heard about it. And that kind of pulled us across our spider graph and helped accelerate that growth. Um, now we have distribution to over 20 million businesses around the world. Uh, we have millions of paid users in our ecosystem. But we couldn't have done that without this kind of magnetic force that allowed uh, things to pull and make our lives a lot easier. Now, the advantage of taking that approach is you can accelerate your growth um, and really reduce the cost of acquisition. So instead of having to build a sales force of 100 people early days, we actually, uh, I was pretty much the, the only sales guy for the first year or two, then we brought on a, a smaller team, but we've been able to be very efficient on our cost of sales because we leverage these network effects. And again, we have that magnetic momentum moving forward. So then we kind of stopped and said, how do we grow even faster? And this is the key theme that I want to impart in all of you today. It's to think about an innovation framework. Now, I'm going to share what we call our flywheel innovation framework, but you can essentially take any approach to this. The biggest thing is think about it. So what we identified when we looked at most, company, most companies and, and most innovation, you start and you see a little bit of growth and traction. You might have a TechCrunch article that pumps things up a little bit. And then at some point, it's, it kind of flattens out. So what we said is to con continue on a high growth curve, we need to continuously think about an innovation window. So you think about the first wave of innovation, and then the second, and then how do you layer on simultaneous multiple innovations at once? And that was really key to what we thought about. So we said, how do we think about creating this evolution for constant innovation? And we developed a framework called Alpha Beta Scale. So at any given time, we have a team that's working on testing new ideas, and we call that our alpha team. And it's as if uh, Nicholas, my co-founder, and I were back in the apartment in day one, where we're brainstorming ideas, we're testing with the market, we're seeing what sticks, and we're okay with failure. But then we use that to think about, okay, how can we, in the beta, then identify what these metrics are? What's our cost of acquisition? How do we think about customer lifetime value? And that gives us confidence on how we can scale. Finally, once we're ready, we go and scale and put a lot of resources to, to scaling that team or innovation. So I'm going to give a few case studies and examples of this. So our first uh, you know, innovation in that niche core was an app listing, or what we called the white-labeled marketplace. And we built that ourselves with our initial team. Then what we did is we said, OK, we need billing to be a robust part of this platform. So how do we think about developing our billing capability? And we looked all around. Do we build it from scratch? Do we partner with others out there? This was the early days of subscription billing. So Zora, Area, Okta um, were, were around that we could kind of leverage some of their uh, existing capabilities. This was pre-Stripe. Um, and then finally, we looked at, are there people that we could potentially look to deeply partner with and, and potentially acquire uh, to make this work? So um, granted, we looked all over the world at different companies. And the company we found was in Ottawa, Canada. And they had been around for 10 years in billing. Um, and they had 120,000 downloads. It was the world's leading open source provider. They part, uh, powered billing for companies like Constant Contact, Sage, Verifone. And at the time, we were probably 20 people and had raised our Series A. So you know, assuming this company was way bigger than us, we thought you know, no chance that we could partner with them, let alone buy them. Um, but went to visit the founder in Ottawa. And uh, he brought me to the Byword market. And I thought, this is strange. I'm not going to your office. 
And he says, you know, you're the first client that's ever come to visit me. And I'm like, really? You know, where's your office? He's like, oh, I don't have one. I work out of my home, and I have a community of 100 contractors around the world. So, um, so it was really fun. And we were able to kind of share our vision for the future and inspire a partnership that allowed us to kind of bring them on our team, give a lot of uh, incentive for the founder to continue kind of running his vision, but we could leverage that technology. So again, if we didn't have that methodology about thinking about build, buy, partner, and experiment with different ideas, we would have kind of lost this opportunity. Now, the three key things that are really important when engaging with any partnership or acquisition is to make sure that you do have alignment of vision, alignment of culture, and then also clarity of how you're going to execute. And I think this is one of the contrarian views that we took, which a lot of people say when you acquire a company, you roll it in, um, you kind of mash management together, you mash technology together. But instead, we kind of have this concept called a two-headed growth strategy, where Emiliano, the founder of JBilling, is still the CEO of JBilling. We run it as an independent subsidiary, which alone is growing at 100% year over year, and they've done that since we bought them three years ago. Now, we leverage their capability for our core product. Um, so we were able to buy that, leverage that, build that, and that's been, been really great for us. But we kind of now have these two simultaneous revenue streams that are accelerating our growth profile and revenue. Um, and again, we would have neglected that if we didn't think about that build by partner, even at an early stage in our growth, when a lot of people would have said it would be impossible for us to, to be able to drive an acquisition. So the next kind of key thing is, how do you keep that flywheel going? We're all working with finite resources. And one thing that we find is no matter if our dev team is 10 people, 20 people, 100 people, now 150 to 200 people, we still can't build what we want to build. So how do you kind of keep that repeat uh, strategy? So again, we go back and we say, OK, what are our alpha initiatives? Um, the next thing that we looked at was uh, identity capabilities. OK, we evaluated build by partner. In this case, we found that there were really great open standards that we could latch on to, like OpenID and SAML. So we decided to build it in-house. And we hired engineers and PMs that have experience in that capability. Next, um, we had data visualization capabilities. And we found a Y Combinator company and team that was really passionate around it. And we brought them on board. So just thinking about that consistent innovation drives that repeatable flywheel. And that's what's enabled us to go from a really tight core um, to expanding really fast and accelerating that momentum. So when you think about these things together, if you can leverage the network effects um, from bringing things to you, magnetic momentum inbound, and if you can also get that flywheel going where you're consistently innovating, then you can start to get an exponential growth curve. Um, and this is what we all want. So the one thing I'd say is, again, these are three strategies. So whether it's contained growth, mag magnetic momentum, or flywheel, these are things that we coined internally based on our knowledge. But I'd encourage you to think about strategies to answer these three questions. So do you have a growth strategy from day one? How does that tie to your vision? Have you thought about the way you can leverage network effects to drive this inbound demand? And then finally, how do you have an innovation framework which goes beyond just thinking about the conventional wisdom of how you build something? But how do you also look to partner or to uh, acquire to accelerate that growth? Um, and just the closing thought I want to leave everyone with is, is it ever too early? And my answer would be no. You should always have a plan. And you can execute at any time by that plan. But it's never too early. And that will help you drive that flywheel. So thanks again, everyone. And I uh, encourage you all to innovate.